there are 8 million YouTube talks online. But if you like, you want to really experience it, you have to come in person. It's great. I mean, you'll just meet such cool people. Right, so um, today I'm going to talk about um, C++ modules. I think there's already um, well, there's many talks about, about this topic, but today I've chosen to focus on the packaging and binary uh, distribution side of, uh, of the story. My name is Luis. Uh, I work uh, at JFrog uh, in the Conan team. So hopefully um, we do have some experience uh, about packaging. I, and hopefully you enjoy, enjoy this talk. Um, so setting the scope uh, a little bit, I will spend uh, a bit, 10 minutes or so um, putting things into context about what are modules and, and their advantages over uh, include, including headers. I will be focusing only on name modules. Um, importable header units have their own set of challenges that are very unique. I, I do recommend that you watch uh, Daniel Russo's uh, talk on, the, uh, on this topic from earlier, earlier in the year. And also, there will be a lot of focus on, if I want to use modules today, what can I do um, if I have externally packaged or externally available modules to uh, bring into, into my project? So which brings us to the first, uh, first slide. This is what we used to, to doing today. This is, we're very familiar with the include uh, directive, which is a preprocessor directive. So it's not a C++ construct, it's mostly a preprocessor construct where the preprocessor will replace that line with the contents of that file once it locates that file. And in this case, that line is 350,000 um, lines of code after that's uh, replaced with the, with the contents. If we miss the first line there with the include, but we do have the, FM, uh, the call to FMT print, What's going to happen is the compiler is going to tell us an error that we're using an undeclared identifier. So mostly, what we, the way we consume libraries is today, is we expect the included headers, at least for the declarations of the functions that we're going to be using later on in the same in the same file. Um, so when we compile, um, when we invoke the compiler, it needs to be able to locate those files that we're referencing. And the compiler is going to look in, in different places, mostly some default locations, either relative to the file during the inclusion or in some present locations, depending on the installation of the compiler, or um, with minus i flags that we can tell a compiler, okay, look in these specific uh, directories. Mostly, we don't expect developers these days to bother with these things. This is going to be handled by the build system or the package manager, so this is uh, an abstraction that they don't have to concern themselves with happily. Um, so, as I said earlier, if we miss, uh, sorry, if we don't pass the correct flags uh, to the compiler or we haven't installed the library, that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to be seeing. So in this case, if I know where uh, FMT is installed and I pass the correct flag to the compiler, this is going to compile successfully. And as I mentioned before, mostly we don't expect people to do that and pass the flags directly. Um, it's likely that developers are going to be using an abstraction like from, from the build system that is hiding that away from them. So these days, luckily, we have modern CMake will handle that for, for us. So we do targeting libraries, our own executable, and we say, okay, link against FMT, and that's going to handle both the compiler flags and the linker flags uh, later, on, later on as well. Now let's see. If I want to install FMT, I have different options depending on, on what operating system I'm on and which tool I'm using, but more or less it's going to be a similar workflow. And in all cases, what's going to happen is somewhere in my file system, this file structure is going to, to appear. What we do have is a set of headers that uh, some of them we can include. Um, they're mostly public, but some libraries do have some private headers that are not meant for uh, public inclusion. We also have obviously in some cases, a compile library. This could be a static library or a share, share library. Obviously, there's also um, header-only header -only libraries. And this is what I'm calling the usage requirements. And in this case, my example is showing CMake uh, target um, configuration files. But this also could be uh, package config files as well, which is going to give us information to be consumed by our build system that's going to eventually derive in the correct compiler flags and linker flags in order for our code to actually build successfully. Now, the import keyword uh, introduced in C++20, the goal is, is the same. Before the, the first use of FMT print, what we want is 
the declaration of that function to be seen by the compiler. So import FMT, now this is a C++ keyword, it's no longer uh, the preprocessor, but the idea is the, same, is the same. After that line, those functions from those libraries will be declared and we'll be able to, to use them successfully. And same as before, if the compiler fails to locate that module, we're gonna see an error like that. Now, why would we want to, to use modules? The short version, and there's a lot, a lot of um, uh, details about this if you uh, watch other talks, is better, better isolation. The headers have some issues when it comes to um, the importer can affect um, the files that you're loading uh, via an include, but also the state of the preprocessor can change after including a file, which can be a problem. Also, the order of imports doesn't matter, but the order of includes can matter. And with modules, we have the potential for improved build times. I'll, I will talk about this later, but there's no guarantee also that uh, the, the build times are going to, be, going to be improved. So I was on, on the topic of the, the isolation that imports provide. I stumbled upon this blog post um, earlier, earlier this month. This was written actually, at least was published two months ago, where a developer said, they stumble upon that error. Does anybody here, um, can anybody identify quickly what that's cost? Nice, just one person? I'm, I'm surprised. Um, so that is caused by the windows.h header. It defines uh, both min and max as a macro uh, that behaves like uh, functions, and then that inclusion affects something else in the second, in the second included file, and the compiler uh, doesn't like it. You have potentially two ways of solving this. You can reorder it such that the first um, included files is the flat buffers header, or you can define, before including the Windows header, uh, define that macro there. Uh, and that's what we could potentially avoid by using uh, imports is no longer have to uh, worry about this, although I will be personally happy if using imports uh, finally settle the scores on whether uh, pragma ones or include guards are the better approach. Uh, <laughs> right, um, so back to, back to the earlier example, and I'm here I'm strictly from the point of view of the, the consumer, right? So this is my, my Hello World uh, application and I'm importing the FMT module and it failed. What do I need to pass to the compiler to, for this to work? And in this case, uh, if I'm using Clang, I need to tell the compiler, okay, the FMT module, you can locate it in that file there that I'm going to explain later uh, details about how to resolve imports. So this is how we currently resolve, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, includes. So the compiler needs to see the path Sorry, it needs to be able to find that file in, in the include paths that it will construct from several sources. But for imports, it depends on the compiler. So each of the, 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 the mainstream compilers, they have different command line interface to control how to resolve that, uh, that import there. So with the interesting one being GCC, that doesn't really allow you to specify, okay, you're gonna find the FMT module in this particular file. Um, as opposed to Clang and MSVC that currently do to support that. Although, as we're gonna see later, this is not going, to be, uh, not going to be a big problem. So now let's say we do have now with modules a different type of um, translation unit, which uh, I'm, I'm reading as module interface unit, that's, that's what they're uh, being called. So we have a C++ file that does the export um, module FMT and once we invoke the compiler with modules enabled and with a specific flag as well, this is going to generate or emit a binary module interface. That's also uh, what they're being called. Every compiler is using uh, their own file extension, although again, uh, this is going to be hidden away from us uh, to a point where it's not going to, not going to matter. Um, this is an oversimplification as well, uh, in the sense that we also have like module implementation uh, units as well, but what we need in order for the importer uh, to resolve the import FMT uh, line is for that file to be generated uh, beforehand. And also, because the module interface units can also include uh, implementation as well, the compiler can emit both files, the object file, as, as if it was a, a regular um, compilation step, 
and the binary uh, module interface, which we can then uh, add to an archive, like a static library or a shared library as well. So that doesn't, doesn't change. What changes is how we really expose the declarations to our, to our code. So let's say we have both the module interface unit for FMT and our uh, main program that will just print, print that line. So what this needs to happen first is we need to invoke the compiler to generate the uh, binary module interface. Only then can we generate uh, the object file for main. And then now we have two object files. As I mentioned before, you can actually include fmt.o into its own library, or you can choose to link it directly, and you have, as, as before, you have now two object files, uh, and you can link the executable, and that executable will just print exactly the hello world that, that we want. Which brings us to the build order. Um, this has been mentioned before, so I, I don't want to spend too much time uh, on this. It was mentioned in, in a talk uh, earlier today, earlier today as well. When you have a large project that has a lot of C++ sources, the, the problem is usually described as embarrassingly parallel. So all the compiler invocations in order to produce object files can happen in parallel, irrespective of each other's. Uh, the order doesn't really matter either. And what we could potentially have here is we could have a large project where the same header file is included in a lot of translation units. And what's currently happened is that the work that the compiler does to load the file, parse it, um, and do its internal, um, internal thing, it happens every single time for every single file. So there's a, some duplication uh, in, in the work the compiler does. Whereas, and I think that's exactly what I mentioned, yes. Whereas if we move to import, now it's a different story. Now it's no longer necessarily embarrassingly parallel, now we care about the order in which things are built. So in this case, we would need to, if all of those files here from alpha to golf do an import FMT, we need to compile that first. At the very least, generate the, uh, the, the BMI, which has the PCM extension uh, over there. And only then can we start building all the others. And if there's no dependencies between those, then those could be, could be parallel as well. Now the idea here, and this would be similar to uh, pre-compile headers, is that all that work that the compiler does to parse that file is only done once, and then is loaded super quickly and efficiently during the import phase uh, when, when loading the module via the uh, PCM file. So that should technically, and hopefully, uh, give us faster compile times, but this would depend on, you know, whether you actually have a situation where the same module is imported by a lot of files and when, whether your project is large enough that you, you have more files than, than cores uh, to parallelize the build and, and something like that. Um, so I was reading also a blog recently, and again, this was uh, published uh, a couple of months ago, about the author of the Flux library that was playing with, uh, with modules and comparing the times it takes to include uh, or for the compiler spends doing a hash include versus the time the compiler uh, spends doing an import uh, flux. So apologies, I did try to sort of make them to, to scale. However, I do have the, the actual numbers here. So include flux took uh, 319 milliseconds, whereas import flux took 14 milliseconds. Now, obviously, for the entire project, for the entire build, the compiler did spend time generating the BMI for flux. So beginning to end, it probably does take the same. So again, the um, advantages when it comes to build times do depend on, on, on the project. Uh, and it's a potential benefit, not a, guarantee, uh, not a guaranteed benefit. Now, obviously, what I just showed you earlier uh, when it comes to the build order was a novel simplification. Uh, you need to bear in mind that the father import can also have their own imports, right? So this means that the um, build, um, graph cannot be arbitrarily, arbitrarily complex. So in this case, in order for me to build my app um, source file with import that does import foo, foo um, the BMI for foo needs to be generated first. And in order for the BMI for foo to be generated, it's going to do import for bar and, and Q, UX. So I need to build those first, which can happen in parallel if there's no dependencies between them, and then this one second, and then this one, this one's last. So now we've gone for, from an embarrassingly parallel problem to a directed 
cyclic graph. I don't know how to pronounce that word in English. I need to actually, I need to actually uh, learn. So no cycles. There cannot be any circular dependencies. So actually, that's a good thing in my, uh, in my book. And a short summary between include and import here is that with include, yes, it's possible that we are compiling, um, that we could potentially be doing the same work if the same file is included in several um, translation units, but that work can happen uh, in parallel, irrespective of, of the order. And the downsides, as we, as we saw earlier, have things to do with the preprocessor state and how you can both influence what you're including and what you're including can influence the rest of the, of the file as it gets parsed. Whereas import, it does away with some of the downsides or the downsides that the preprocessor has, but it introduces a dependency order between translation units which until recently and early this year hasn't, uh, wasn't actually fully solved. I will not be going uh, into much detail about this, but now the compilation model is actually two phases. In the first phase, we call a compiler once for every file that we are aware of to ask the compiler, what is the name of uh, the exported module that this file is exporting, if any, and which imports are required. And with that information, we can do a second pass where we can build everything in the correct order. This also means that we need the help of the build tool as well. The build tool should be able to reorder um, the build dynamically based on the information from the first few steps. So this is why it has been implemented in CMake. And they do have a blog post uh, about this on uh, a paper as well that I do recommend uh, you read. This was from earlier in the year in, in January. And these features work in recent versions of pretty much, pretty much everything. So Clang 16, Visual Studio 17.4. For GCC, the support to uh, do the dependency scanning wasn't merged until I think it was two weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. So that was uh, um, not long ago. I, I was happy I was able to, to test it before, before the talk. Um, CMake 325 is when this was first introduced. I would imagine that CMake 328, which is yet to be released, is going to have uh, the GCC uh, 14 support. Otherwise, you, you still have to copy some magic. And Ninja 1.10, I think, is the one that has the um, dynamic dependency uh, support. And MS Build, irrespective, even if you're using MS Build without, without CMake and just Visual Studio uh, projects directly, that supports it natively as well. So that's, I think we're in a better place that we've been uh, the rest of the year, so that's, or, or even before um, when it comes to modules, so this is, this is great. And it's a really good starting point. So actually, dependency scanning in, in, uh, in this context works really, really well, and it's really, I don't know, uh, encouraging to see the compilers, CMake, and the builders as well, because Ninja is also involved uh, working together. I think this is a win for the C++ ecosystem to sort of see things finally, uh, finally clicking. And if you want to, if you have a project that uses modules um, and you want to use modules today using this feature, there's a, an important constraint is like the build system needs to be able to see all of the source files for everything that does an export, right? So at the moment, this means that all of your dependencies need to be, need to be part of your build, right? Which is exactly what I hope we can, we can avoid uh, in the future. So, what I've been experimenting and I'm here to talk about today is, let's say I have this, this, this toy project uh, on the left. I have a project where I find package uh, FMT uh, in CMake, and I want to build that executable uh, there on the right, which is the one I've been showing. And what I want is like, only change the C++ file from include um, the FMT header, change into an import, and expect everything else to remain the same. So I don't really want to have to change anything here. I am aware that yes, the, the CMake uh, module functionality is experimental and you do need to add some flags. But apart from that, you know, in the future we expect that not to be, not to be the case. And we want to rely on the abstractions. So the, when I do targeting libraries uh, against FMT, I'm hoping that that causes the right things to happen in the right order without having the developer to be exposed to, to any of that. Um, and this is what I, as I mentioned earlier, this is what a library package looks like today. So the question is, what does this look like for a package module library, right? And for experimentation, what I, what I did was uh, I took a recent uh, version of FMT, so 10.1.1, and I made a few changes in a fork um, for FMT to use the new 
CMake functionality so I could run my, my experiments. So it's, it's literally just uh, pretty much upstream FMT just with some small changes in the, in the CMake list, so they're there for, for reference. And this is how we typically package libraries today. Either we do no packaging and we adopt the sources of FMT into, into our project, but it's still worth mentioning this, and I'll get to that in a second. Or we have static libraries, shared libraries, or we can even have header-only libraries where what we have is only the headers and maybe some um, file like CMake telling us if needed, some compiler uh, flags or, or similar. And where I'm adding a, a CMake folder under the lib folder there, that's what I mentioned before. It could be integration uh, files. It could be a package config file as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be, have to be CMake. As for modules, in my experiments, what I'm going to be talking about today is the same. I, we can try the no packaging approach where we're including the sources of the external dependency as part of our own build. I've made an experiment of packaging the binary module interface alongside a compile a, a linked library, uh, if it's a shared library or a static library. Uh, another experiment where we package the library and the module interface units, that is the C++ source code for the file that does the export and every other file in, necess, needed by that, uh, by that file. And I will also talk about a module only and what implications that could have or if that's even possible. So let's start with no packaging. Um, this actually, as I mentioned before, Works, works really well. So the constraint of, of being able to use the CMake uh, dynamic dependency scanning is that all the files that do an export are actually visible by the build system. A way of achieving this is do, uh, using the fetch, con fetch content module, but that's equivalent of having a subfolder with FMT and not in add subdirectory. So that's actually going to ha uh, work just, just fine. So there's not much to talk about here. That just actually, actually does work. So I'll move on to, to the next one which is packaging the binary module interface. Now, before I talk about this, um, I should, obviously we should all be aware that this is discouraged by, by the compiler vendors. So BMIs are not compatible across compilers and they're not even guaranteed to be compatible across um, different versions of the same, same compiler as uh, the GCC documentation uh, tells us about. We should consider this a rebuildable cache artifact and not a distributable object. So whereas today when with traditional libraries, if I'm on Linux and I have FMT library, I can use a library with any version of GCC as long as the, uh, it's still ABI compatible or Clang as well. So that's not a problem. If I choose to package the VMI alongside the library, that means that I can only consume that package with exactly the same compiler and exactly the same compiler version as the one that produced the BMI. So that would be completely moving away from having things that are reusable and interoperable between different compiler implementations to something very, very specific. So now I was, in a way I was excited because, or excited or thinking this was possible because in Kana what we have is we model different binary packages depending on, on, on some settings and those settings being precisely the compiler and the compiler version uh, amongst, amongst other things. So I thought, well, each of these in the Conan model would be a completely different package, a completely different um, folder in, in, the, in the file system as well. So if I'm a consumer uh, of FMT or any other library, and I am using specific versions of the compiler, I can use Conan in a way where I expect those libraries to have been also built with those uh, particular, particular versions. So I thought this could be, this could be something that, that we could do. Although bear in mind that this is even Using BMIs is even more strict that one Conan, um, than how Conan works by default. So you would actually have to, especially if you're using Conan, Conan 2, you would have to disable uh, the compatibility that PY extension that we have. Um, and you would have to specify the exact compiler version uh, in, in your Conan profile or in your settings when you, when you request um, the, the libraries and not necessarily just for teams. So at, at the moment, for instance, for GCC, we model, okay, all of the GCC 14 binaries are compatible with each other, so we don't really uh, bother too much um, about making different packages for different versions of GCC. 
in this case, if we want to package the BMIs, we would have to, we would have to do that. So I did a little experiment where, uh, and I started with uh, MSVC actually. So in order for a consumer, assuming that we already have the, uh, the BMI down there, in order for a consumer to be able to restore the import FMT, FMT line, um, I would need to pass that compiler flag and this slash reference FMT and the path to that file, um, which in this case, sorry, for F MSBC, the extension would be a IFC. So we already have abstraction for, abstractions for this, which is basically, oh, okay, you're a consumer and you need to add this flag in order for this, in order for this to work. So CMake does that in, uh, in the exported targets, that's the interface compile, compile flags. Uh, that's also the C flags field in the uh, package config files. We do this similar to include directories, actually, when, when you think about that. So what I did is I invoke CMake in my, um, in my fork of FMT. I call CMake install to generate that um, folder structure. And then I manually modify the file to actually add that uh, interface, interface compile options, conditional on the compiler being MSVC, passing exactly that. And well, that actually did work um, just fine, as we can see here. So I created, again, a consumer project that was doing fine package FMT, just as I described earlier. And I made sure that he found the one that I just generated when he called fine package FMT. And it actually works um, fine. So I thought, great. I could use um, Conan. I, I will write a Conan recipe, which I've written for, for FMT with module support as well. And in the package info, I will, I will tell Conan to propagate to the consumers uh, the location, the flags uh, required to consume the, the BMI. So I thought, oh, well, this could work, uh, except for GCC, as I mentioned before, GCC doesn't really have a flag to specify a particular, a particular module to be, um, where to locate a specific module. So I tried, okay, I'm going to build the, the, uh, the library using Conan, which will invoke CMake, which will then package it, and then I will use it from a, from a consumer um, project. And it didn't work. So I used Clang actually instead of MSVC. So I was using Clang on, on Linux and it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because despite the fact that it is passing the, the, the correct flag, pointing to the correct file, Clang is very strict about the compiler flags that you use both when generating a BMI and importing a BMI on, on the other side. So the FMT project, if you look at their, uh, at their build scripts, when you're building it as a standalone project, as we did here, as opposed to including it uh, as a subdirectory of a different project, it passes minus F visibility equals hidden to, to the compiler. And the BMI is going to retain that information. So when I'm on the consumer side of things and I import that BMI and I'm not passing the visibility hidden flag, it's, it just doesn't load it. Um, so that doesn't actually work. And that's also in the documentation of, of Clang here. So obviously, we knew there were some risks. It's not worth it. <laughs> Do follow the documentation of the compilers. And this is very, very strict here. And my, um, and I will talk about this later as well. This actually was not an issue with GCC. So GCC, I was able to generate a VMI when building the library. And then obviously, with some manual experimentation, I was able to compile and link the consumer ju just fine. So here's another thing. Obviously, the, the GCC documentation said compiler and compiler version, don't, don't take them, um, don't assume they're going to be compatible. Clang also tells us that the compiler flags actually matter. There needs to be a consistency, consistency between them. But what consistency means across compilers is also different. So whereas um, Clang was very strict, GCC was, was less strict. So now we have the concept of BMI compatibility. The importer needs to be compatible with, the, with how the BMI was, was generated. That's why this approach is not necessarily um, going to be useful for us, but I think it was still good to um, experiment with it just for illustration purposes. Another downside um, as well is because it was working, um, well, actually it wasn't, wasn't working at all. I tried building the module with the BMI on one computer in one specific uh, file system path and then consume it on a different computer. And then it loads the BMI 
But if it cannot file the source file for the BMI, then the compiler is going to fail. So, and you might think, well, why is that happening? You don't strictly need that file, but it actually does need it. If, there's any, if there are any compiler errors in how you're using the, the functions, the compiler will usually tell you there's an error, and it will show you which file and which line is, is causing the error. Um, and I, I suspect that's why it needs that file to, to exist, so that you can actually follow that and on, in your IDE, you click on that file, and you can actually open and go straight to that line and, and try to figure out what, what was wrong. And Again, uh, this was different across, across compilers. So I did the same with um, Visual C++. I, I tried to fabricate something that would cause a compiler error by calling the FMT print function with the wrong type of argument. And in this case, MSBC doesn't care that the, file doesn't, the original source file doesn't exist in, in the current file system. But when it shows the error, it's referencing a location that doesn't exist on my machine at the moment. So if this was in the IDE, I would not be able to, to just double click and go and, and, and check, right? So this could be a problem for tooling as well and IDE integration. So that's yet another reason to not package the, the BMIs alongside, right? This is not interoperable across um, compilers as before. And if you were to do this, you would have to be very, very strict and you would need the ability to have very strict control of the compiler, the compiler version, the compiler flags, the ability to have the source files in the same locations as uh, the location they were when the BMI was generated. And this is not guaranteed. Um, the behaviors are not guaranteed across compilers. So I would say this is very risky, and I would discourage um, packaging the BMIs. But I would imagine that there is some slice of reality where if you have control of all these variables, it would work. Um, I just don't want to be there to, to discover that, to be honest. Moving on to, to the, next, um, the next thing is, how about we compile the module interfaces and we follow the spirit of the compiler documentation where that says they need to be, uh, the BMIs need to be generated locally. So let's ship alongside the libraries, we ship the, the module interface, interface units that export uh, the modules. Um, and this is more complicated because it's no longer a case of in order to use this library, you need to add this compiler flag to, on the consumer side, but now it becomes in order to use this library, you need to locate the source file of the module interface unit, you need to invoke the compiler, you need to keep track of where you generated the BMI, and then you need to pass that to, to the consumer. So I would say in this particular instance, we cannot rely, strictly speaking, on um, Existing, existing abstractions because now the build system needs to translate code that it's not part of the build, so it needs to be aware of that um, as well. Um, and this is a new capability that we need to build, uh, need to give build systems. And again, CMake is the only one so far that's, uh, actually no, that's not true. Build2 has, a, uh, ha has had for a while the ability to do this, relying on some special field in the package config files, although it doesn't support uh, dependency scanning in the same way as CMake, so it could be, it could be a little tricky, but that, there's a precedent for this. So this was merged a month ago, I think, support modules on imported targets as well. So the idea is, and I will show you uh, in the next slide, the generated CMake targets file will now contain information that pertains to, to modules and how to use it. So the important things here would be uh, at the very bottom is which files are actually uh, C++ modules. That will, mm, I, I would imagine that the way this works is that with this information, CMake now knows that it needs to scan those files in order to um, determine which modules it exports so that the files can generate the BMIs, and the, the, sorry, so that the build system can generate the BMI on the fly before any file that does uh, the import, and also, we have the ability, if a file needs to be compiled, we have compiler definitions, compiler features, and include directories as well. So in the ideal, simple, more simple, most simple case, you, everything is self-contained in, in the file, but the reality these days, uh, especially for um, libraries that are being adapted from legacy libraries that use includes, is that you're probably gonna have uh, header files that you need to include, you're probably going to have compiler definitions that you, need to, that you need to pass in order to translate the module interface uh, to a uh, BMI. So let's see how this works now. So 
On the left, we have this is what the package uh, would look like. We have the module interface uh, file, and we have the, the library as well. And the build system would generate the BMI, and that would be ready for when we compile the imported that CPP into an object file, and then we would link directly uh, with the library, which would provide the symbols. And that works, actually, with CMIC, as far as I've been able to test, so that's, that, that's great. I would imagine that the CMIC uh, folks would um, be able to present this better. I've only tested a small subset in a really, really uh, simplistic uh, program. And if you recall from earlier, uh, when translating the um, module interface, it generates two files. In this case, we need to Tell, ask the compiler to not generate the object file because now all that information is already included in the, in the library file. So the compilers do provide flags, uh, flags for this to only generate the, the, the BMI and completely ignore the, the object file. Otherwise, we might end up having symbols in multiple places and we don't like that. So this is actually, in terms of like how to move forward with modules, uh, the, way to, the way to go because all the VMIs are generated locally, which ensures that we're using the same compiler and the same compiler versions as the files that are doing the, the import as well, and also ensures that the module interface units are visible and exist on a local file system, which will actually, well, help Clang make any progress at all and error reporting in, in, in the other compilers. But notice that I'm saying it increases compatibility, it doesn't guarantee compatibility, and I will talk about this um, a bit, in the next few slides, but now the usage requirements need to be need to be expanded. So, in an ideal case, only having the list of files, external files that provide modules, would be sufficient. But the reality is, as I mentioned, we are going to need um, include uh, directories, include flags, macro definitions, compiler options that are needed by that particular module. So that creates a whole new category of uh, of information that we need to add to something like a CMIC. Uh, export the target. We don't even have standards ways of de describing a package or a library at all. So this just increases the complexity on something that doesn't really exist yet. So there are a couple of, of papers on, on the topic of how we can do this uh, in the future. And I would imagine that the ongoing efforts to actually get something standardized will take this into consideration as well. So it's yeah, another layer of complexity uh, on top of an already challenging um, landscape, I'm afraid. Um, regarding headers, or no headers, I mentioned that we're packaging the module interface uh, file, the source file for, for the file that does export FMT, and the library, and, and the generated CMIC files as well, and that's an oversimplification, but we may have include, include files. Why may we have include files? There's two possible reasons for this, and I've actually seen, seen at least uh, hints for both. One, the most obvious one, is that in order to compile this file, we need to include files uh, from FMT itself because it, it's shipped that way, and that's actually the reality today. Or maybe because we want dual support, like we want the same library and, and, and the same uh, CMIC files to support uh, consumers that are doing include FMT slash core.h or import FMT. Now, that is, Tricky, but not impossible. And I've seen actually uh, in, in the FMT sources uh, themselves that you can ask the, by using um, specific, uh, what's this? Extern C++, you can detach the symbols from the module and attach them to the global module, so to speak, so that presumably that would actually help support both. I'm not sure at the moment today if there's an interest uh, whatsoever in having the same library be compatible with both. Um, as you, there, there's other um, talks on the topic, but all the symbols exported by a module are attached to the module. So there's additional mangling that happens in the binaries that go into the library. So that library, while it has the same sim symbols in terms of the, the, the functions are the function definitions and all of that, is actually not binary compatible with users, uh, consumers using includes. So. It looks like it's technically possible to have that, either by uh, detaching the module symbols from, from, from the module and into the, um, putting them in the global scope, or by duplicating the symbols of, of the library such that it has both the module attached symbols and the global symbols as well. That's, I'm just putting the idea out, out there because there's a chance that having that support would increase 
the chances that we can, um, the adoption of, of modules, uh, libraries. Now, and the last um, packaging uh, method I want to uh, talk about is only distributing the sources for, for the module interfaces. Um, Header-only libraries today are very popular, and I remember a few months ago we uh, noticed that in Conan Center, roughly one in four recipes are actually for uh, header-only libraries because they are perceived as easy to integrate, right? People like uh, have the idea that you don't have to worry about ABI compatibility or anything going wrong, that you just simply, uh, or any other flags than minus I with the path to where you, you find, find headers. Now, what do we do if we're only given uh, a, a library that may or may not have the implementation in, in the files and we want to use it? At the very least, we know that we have to invoke the compiler to generate the BMI. Um, and if we recall from a package window library with both the module interface and the, and the library, we, have, uh, we can generate both files we discard the object files because we expect the symbols to be satisfied by, by the library. But if we only bundle or if we only ship the module interface, do we need, we no longer have a library with symbols. So what do we do with that file? We can directly potentially link it to the executable or we can also create a library as well. And here is like the answer for this is I'm not exactly sure what we should do. Um, because we also run the risk of having the same symbols defined in multiple places. Uh, if, that, if that wasn't an executable, but it was a shared library, and you have multiple shared libraries that have files that are doing import FMT, you have the risk of symbols uh, ending up in, in all those places as well. Do, do we instead want to take the object file, uh, have it in a library, either a static library or a shared library, and I'm not sure who would make that decision and uh, what the best approach um, for that is. But we also have cases where the object file that is generated when, um, when translated the module interface doesn't actually matter much. So if you look at the code on, on, on the left, um, that is the output of the object file, which is only the initializer for the, for the module. Uh, but actually, I, I tested this. And if you have an import uh, foobar, it doesn't need the symbols at all, because there are no symbols, right? The symbols actually end up in, in the consumer when you instantiate uh, the template or by sort of resolving the uh, constant expression there. So it's interesting that we may not need that object file at all. So right now, today, I'm not entirely sure whether module-only libraries where we are only given a source file would work unless we just assume that it's actually equivalent to the first case where you're not packaging anything at all, you're just adopting the source code of those external, of those external libraries. So yeah, summary here, this is still, uh, I would need to see more libraries that actually, uh, actually claim to do this. I, I was only able to find one library and uh, I wasn't even able to build it at all. I'm also gonna talk about that. So when it comes to module, uh, only libraries, like do we build it into a library? Do we propagate the object file across any executable or linked uh, um, artifact that needs it? Do we discard the object files? It's, it's hard, to, um, hard to tell for me today. So I think this approach, the module, packaging the module interfaces and the binary libraries is what's going to eventually happen. This is in the spirit of, of what the compiler uh, vendors document when they say this, this needs to be generated locally to, to your build. Um, and now I'm gonna move to, to the next section of the, of the talk, which is BMI com compatibility. Recall that I mentioned earlier that that approach increases the chances that the, um, the BMIs are compatible when we know that if we bundle a, a pre-built BMI there's no guarantees. We saw that with uh, we saw that with, with Clang with the visibility flag. We saw that with Clang when the file didn't exist uh, in on the consumer side, the source file. But for instance, let's say we have a package module library where the library file that we have was generated by building that file with um, the C plus plus twenty standard, and on the consumer side. And then obviously we do discard those, those, those files, we don't ship them, we do ship both the library and the, 
and the module interface. And on the consumer side, the entire consumer side is built in C++23. This already happens when you're using libraries that have includes. For the most part, in most scenarios, you can expect that to actually work. So uh, you could have built a library with C++11, 14, 17, and it will still work with uh, 20 and 23, unless you're using things that have been completely deprecated or removed, or unless, and I've seen some libraries that they have like conditional uh, um, definitions depending on some um, macros that check which, 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 which version of the standard we're using. Hopefully you, you haven't stumbled upon, upon those. So that actually, in theory, should, should work. Uh, and if I do it manually, it does work. Um, I can build that entire right-hand side of, the, um, of this project with C++23 and link against a library that was built with C++20. So this, this works. And notice that, obviously, we discarded the BMI that we, was generated when, uh, when building a library, but it is, they were built completely differently, right? So what using the, um, the approach of generating BMI on the consumer side gives you is that it brings you closer to something that you can actually import because the importer there has uh, minus STDC plus plus 23 as well. Well, let's see uh, a, a different case where I am using, uh, and this is from taken from the example earlier, where I am including the sources of FMT into my project and then I'm being a little cheeky and then I'm saying, okay, I know that FMT is built with C++20 because I, I added it at the top of the, of this uh, FMT CMIC lists. But I'm saying, okay, this target, hello, is actually uh, C++23. And I did that on purpose. I know there's different ways of telling uh, CMIC to, to use a different standard version, but I did this one on purpose because I think it would be the most obscure um, that it couldn't see through. And obviously what happens here is that it will not, work. Why? Because when uh, creating the FMT library, and again, this was all part of my project, all of these things were visible to CMake. That was done with C++20. The BMI, there's nothing in CMake at the moment, uh, and there might be in the future that tells CMake, you know why? That consumer is C++23. The BMI should be um, rebuilt, right? Uh, otherwise, they're not compatible, and this is the, this is the issue that we're going, to, we're going to face. And now that was actually GCC. So this is not Clang being too, uh, too strict. This is actually GCC being um, quite sensible, in my, my opinion. Uh, another example here, which I think was um, more, more complex. So I tried to mix and match different libraries and so not just FMT, but also Flux that I mentioned earlier. Uh, RPARS as well. So there was a talk earlier this year in, in, in C++ and C by Daniela Engert, um, where I think she has a fork um, of ArcPars as well that supports um, um, modules with the um, CMake experimental features. So I added that as an uh, add subdirectory as well. And then I saw this error when building my executable there that is linking against Flux, FMT, ArcParks, and this other local um, library foo that actually does nothing. And I was getting this error that I, and I thought, hmm, am I missing something in my hello um, target, am I missing some compiler flag or no? But it was a little more involved than that. Um, my app has basically those four imports there. Um, and all of them, as I said, they're all local to, to, to the build. Um, and this one in particular, what I noticed, and this is, I, I tried to um, make it more more minimal compared to what's actually in the code from, from, from Daniela, is that when it's using Clang, it's, it's propagating that compiler flag the size deallocation. So what's happening here is that both my app, and because I'm linking against R pars, both of those are being built with size deallocation, but all the others aren't, right? So I thought, okay, at least the importer is being built with flags that are compatible with what I'm importing. That's good, that's what we expect. Um, especially because, well, it was a, a public uh, requirement. But now Clang expects everything else that you're importing that has nothing to do with uh, arc bars to also be built with the same flux. And I'm not sure here if Clang is actually being way too strict and this shouldn't be a problem and it's probably something that we could report as a bug, or actually this is fine, but what I'm failing to um, see through is what's gonna happen in, in, in the future here 
where how can a build system reason that that's going to be a problem? And if a developer faces this or a build system maintainer faces this, what should they do? I mean, knowing the story behind the size of the allocation with uh, Clang on Linux that is using the standard library from GCC, actually, the thing to do would be to enable that globally for the entire project. But my fear is like, how would a, develop, a developer reason that that's what they, they should do? So BMI compatibility, even if every, the sources for all important modules are visible to the build system, the dependency scanning will give us the correct build order, that's good. But it may, dif it may be difficult for the build system to actually reason that we are going to have incompatible BMIs. And in this case, it was very indirect as well. So the solution would have been to add extra flags to other BMIs that had nothing to do with, um, with the one that require, that require that flag. Which leads us to, we may need to build multiple variants, uh, multiple BMI variants for the same module. So I'm sensing that the build systems are going to, unless the compilers are, can be more predictable around what's compatible and what's not, we may have to actually build multiple BMI variants. So that's what I said earlier. Remember when I said we have potential for uh, saving time in, uh, when building a large project. We may be impacted by this. That was under the assumption that we had to generate the BMI once and it had to be reloaded whenever there was an import. Now we may have to generate a BMI multiple times depending on the flags that you have across your project. Uh, which leads me to actually how errors are, are reported. Uh, errors related to dependencies are frustrating. If you go on um, Slack, um, Stack Overflow and search uh, the, the C++ thread, I can guarantee that in the past two, two weeks you can find things that were related to consuming dependencies. And the way I reason about this is like, with an error that a user is uh, facing and asking a question about uh, on Stack Overflow, Where's the solution? The solution is usually you have to change nothing in your project or your build scripts. The solution has to do with how the dependency was brought in, right? Which can be very difficult uh, for a lot of developers to actually reason and locate where does the solution um, have to be, right? So modules introduce a completely new dimension and, and, and sort of classes of errors. When generating a BMI, locating a BMI, although I'm happy to say that uh, the features implemented by, by CMake and MS Build and, and so, reduce that chance massively. Loading load a BMI as well, and as we have seen, because of the compiler option uh, mismatches, depending on whether the compiler is, is strict about them. Um, another thing is like when you actually have the, um, the import has succeeded, but then when you're calling a function that was exported by that module, there's an error there. And I will show you an example now. And obviously linker errors that are um, happen as a result of the module. So I'm, sure, I'm gonna show you some examples. Um, when translating a, a module interface unit, if I build the FNT as a module using a recent GCC and I forget to add a, an optimization level, uh, I get an internal compiler error. This has been reported, it's obviously, it's obviously a bug. If I add minus 02, 00, uh, OG, it's going to succeed. But I was very confused because um, this obviously, I, I don't know that, that the solution was to add an optimization flag. Um, another one is like, it works, it generates the, um, the module, it, the, the consumer can actually succeed in importing a module, but it fails in the very same line where I'm calling FMT print. And it fails with an error, and I did not manage to uh, reason about it at all, but I know that if I do that, then that works, and it builds. And I, and I checked, and I was, um, I was at Andreas' uh, talk earlier about how the FMT module should have included that header file in the um, global module fragment in order to avoid errors, but it actually was there uh, correctly. So I'm, I have no clue. If anybody knows about this, by the way, let me know. <laughs> I actually, I'm actually very curious about what, uh, why the behavior is that one. Uh, and yes, the compiler is telling me that it is confused by earlier errors. If the compiler is confused, Believe me, uh, I'm, completely, I'm completely helpless. And another one here, and let me see if I, if I get this correctly. I built uh, with um, GCC, I built FMT as a share library, and then I used the, the recently merged feature from CMake, 
where um, I generate the, an, an installed tree that is importable as well. I cannot import it because I get that, that linker error as well. That doesn't happen when I consume it from the same project and I build a project as a, as a shared library again. I, I'm confused. It's all, it's all confusion. However, I'm not very discouraged by any of this in the sense that I'm assuming that a lot of these are actually bugs that are going to, I'm probably one of the first people that have been building all these different combinations, building one folder as part of the same project, as a separate project. So that will, I would expect that as more people actually um, start adopting modules, we're gonna see a lot of this. But what I need to do now, well, I have to do two things. I just got an email from John where I have to upload my slides and then I have to open bugs or bug reports against uh, some of these things. I know only one uh, has at least uh, been reported, the one about optimizations um, when building the GCC, uh, sorry, FMT with GCC. So some conclusions. Slowly but steadily, more libraries are adding experimental support for modules, although it's typically either module or legacy headers, not both. And it's a question of whether that's going to be uh, a thing at all. Dynamic dependency scanning from what I've seen, both from MSBuild itself and CMIG, it does work really, really well and it solves the, the build, order, uh, build order issues. CMIG is adding support for, uh, for imported targets, but I think in the future we're going to see how that works with uh, BMI uh, compatibility. Now the question here that actually brings me here is, can package managers help? And I would say yes. So the situation up until recently is that you could only benefit from all these new features if all the files doing the exporting of the modules were part of your project now, um, which means if you have full control. But I think you can use package managers in a way that you retain the control without bringing the universe into your own project. So you could, uh, and we are going to be um, doing this in Conan as well, exploring which features we need to support. And once he make, uh, adds the, um, the support for imported targets, we are going to um, implement our counter part right away uh, to support that in, in our Conan, Conan packages. But obviously, and again, you could also choose to not uh, wait until a feature and package it to BMIs, but it's not practical because as we've seen, uh, there's a lot of uh, high chance of incompatibilities and you cannot even really use it depending on a compiler using a different, in a different machine. But otherwise, package managers cannot really help in, in the sense that um, Build systems are going to need to support dependency scanning and um, building BMIs for external modules as well. And at the moment, uh, only, only CMake is uh, capable of doing that and build to uh, it in some uh, way as well. And I personally have lots of questions about BMI compatibility and even within the same project, how or whether we could make life easier for developers by having logic that guarantees that a proper BMI is um, generated, even if you have different compiler flags across the project, without necessarily causing the other side of the uh, equation an, an ABI incompatible um, code between the code that you're just building and the library that was pre-built and, and given to you. And that would be, that would be all. Any questions? Uh, really great talk. I, I really enjoyed like the experimentation that you, uh, you went through here and the pain I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but so I kind of have, I think I kind of have like a top level comment, which is that it seems like the vast majority of the experiment is leaning in the direction of let's try to treat, uh, module interfaces as kind of like header only libraries. And to some degree you can try to do that. But I think what you might find is that assumption may be challenged at some point, specifically because there's nothing in the standard that says you can't have a global variable that's created in the module interface and then exported. And if you try to treat it as a header-only library, you might actually run into situations where you create multiples of these things, and now you have like multiples of these global variables just hanging out, and where does the, where is the OBJ the associated OBJ go. So that's that's one reason why we at, uh, sorry, I represent Microsoft. 
That's why one reason why we at Microsoft have been suggesting, you know, when you create the BMI, you also package it with the associated OBJ file when you created that thing, because it's, it's most likely going to contain generated code that you're going to need at the final link time. And the other thing too, is the BMI itself could also contain generated code, like inline functions, inline variable definitions, all of that kind of stuff, which is why the compiler flags being consistent from creation to consumption is so important. So that's my, my comment. Uh, yeah, so one, one comment, because I, I didn't understand, it's not necessarily the, the suggestion that things are moving into the direction of being like, like header-only libraries. I think in the examples, most of the, uh, the things are experimented with, um, you do ship the file during the export, but the actual contents of the object go in an actual library file as before. So when you, when you're, not, you're not expecting to uh, generate the object file on the consumer side and also link it, uh, whatever, right? So that, to me, that, that still guarantees that it's in a um, sort of the, the symbol, especially if you have globals, will be in, 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 a single, in a single place. If we have to support like actual, like module only libraries, then yes, it's like, what do you do? Like, and that's, that's what I have that, that slide with the questions is like, where do you link that symbol? Even linking it where it's needed, if it's needed in multiple shared libraries, uh, that could end up in different shared libraries. And on Windows, that's not a problem because symbols are hidden by default unless you sort of uh, export them. But on Linux, that would cause them to be in a lot of places as well. So I do also share, share the same concerns, yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, thank you very much. I have a practical question as a person who writes libraries sometimes. So uh, I'm very sorry if you work for JFrog, but header-only libraries are really nice because it's just git clone, right? Git clone and minus i, unless things don't work. Uh, and so my, my question would be, do we expect that with modules, you can get a similar experience? Right, that, that basically, if you have a, a library that uses modules, that it will be as easy to include as a header-only library, but with, uh, not without all the drawbacks of header-only libraries. Um, at the moment, my answer would be no. No, I wouldn't expect that um, to be that simple. Um, actually, yeah, it depends, like, like, um, like from the question from before, you can actually have different, different things, but you may actually need to have objects somewhere that need to be linked somewhere. You have to be careful about where, where they end. So at the moment, I would need to actually see like, like module only libraries and I only saw one, but I feel like you have to make a decision somewhere. It's not as simple as doing a git clone and uh, having a, adding it to a path where the compiler is looking for includes. Now I think you need to have a compiler invocation no matter what. And that compiler invocation, then you need to decide what to do with the outputs as well. So at the moment, my, my answer would be no, but I'm, if, so, can I to Chase said, so FMT, right? It has two modes of building, mm -hmm. right? But the difference is basically like, do you want to buzzer with compiling the CPP file or not? Right? Yeah. So could they have one? Do you think that it's possible for them to have one mode where they, yeah, you, sh you should compile the file and no, it's not a problem anymore? I think for modules, you're going to have to compile the file. Yeah. yeah. But it would be painful. Like, I don't care. If, uh, um, well, it shouldn't be. That's the thing. But I think we're going to have to come up with things to, to give a similar experience. So I think, I think what, whatever needs to happen there to uh, enable that, I don't think that exists yet. I could be wrong, but yeah. All right. That's what, Thank uh, you. No worries. <laughs> Easier said than with none. Yeah. Hi. Um, How's it going? Thanks for the uh, talk. That was good. Um, it was you. great to see people experimenting with this. And Finding the bugs, I think that's sort of the ne next step is to test the boundaries of this stuff. Um, one thing I wanted to comment on was we definitely in the CMake land, we have been thinking about the compiler flag incompatibilities. And one of the conclusions we're heading down to is I think much like for the dependencies, we had to reach back to the compilers for help. I think we're gonna have to do the same thing again and be able to say, hey, compiler, are these two sets of flags going to create a compatible BNI? Oh, no? Okay, then I'll create a second compilation. And, but we're going to have to be able to ask the compiler that. Otherwise, we're just going to assume everything's incompatible, and then we're going to be wasting a lot of time. So I think some specification in working with the compilers on yet another round of uh, implementing something, which 
at least with the module format thing took three years. Um, <laughs> hopefully we can do it a little quicker. But yeah, it's definitely something we're thinking about. Absolutely, no, that, that's a very good idea. Yeah, otherwise I don't see how we can get out of this problem, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for going through all the work of uh, figuring all this out. It, it's way more complex than I realized it was gonna be. Uh, when modules were announced, I was actually kind of excited. It sounded great. Um, and that kind of gets to my question that like, there's been a lot of time figuring this out. And right now it doesn't sound like it's worth it. Like this shouldn't be used in production at this point. Um, do you think we will get there? Does it seem like we, it is going to be possible to be worth it? <laughs> Because um, it's introducing so much more complexity, even if it works smoothly, there's going to be a lot more things to think about. You were talking about like new classes of errors and all this stuff. I'm like, I, I'm already dealing with enough errors. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to worry about it. Do you think we'll get there? Um, I think we will get there. Yes, I think it's going to be a bumpy ride. So uh, a, a lot of issues until now actually had to do with figuring out the uh, the dependency scanning uh, as well properly, right? And a different set of issues have to do with the transition from what we're doing now to, uh, well, using modules. If you have a project that uses modules from the get-go, including the standard library in C++23, uh, and you have more or less a global control over the compiler flags, chances are that things are gonna work fine, right? So I think the problem is also compounded by, by the legacy and, and whether or how do we migrate. Uh, some, some of the errors I, I saw, especially with the locale thing in GCC or GCC itself was confused. Um, I think it has to do with because it was a, a header, but I, I need to test if I'm using C++23 uh, and, and don't use any includes at all, maybe that actually makes it, uh, makes it better. So I think the answer is yes, but the, the question is how quickly can we make it and still be robust? As for a lot of errors, uh, I'm, yes, um, I'm confident that we'll get through, like, solve the things that make them more robust anyway. Thank you for, so I, much. Is there time for more questions, sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, we can talk after, afterwards, no worries. Thank you, everyone.